We will be um, losing a number of experienced um, support workers um, over the next uh, decade or so. Um, support workers tend to have care and responsibilities and quite interesting, I think the NHS doesn't tend to be the first job that support workers have had. So most support workers in, in mental health included have come from other jobs before joining the health service. There are a whole load of qualifications um, that support workers possess. Um, and I think this partly is a reflection of the fact that qualification entry requirements are set by individual employers. So there's a lack of consistency between employers sometimes. On average, um, people are graded at band three and they will have a level three, which is like an A-level um, qualification. But we found people in our survey that had no formal qualifications. And one person actually had a PhD and just about everything in between. So there's a whole load of qualifications that support workers possess, um, which does have a number of issues in terms of transferability and uh, consistency. It's a really loyal workforce. Um, the support workers love working in the NHS. They love um, their job, they're very loyal to the NHS, no, almost nobody in our sample wanted um, to work anywhere else, and they're also loyal to their trust, so turnover rates around mental health support workforce is a bit lower actually than support workers more generally, so a loyal workforce, but also an aspiring workforce, so support workers do want to progress their careers, about a quarter of our sample wanted to remain in their current grade, um, a quarter wanted to move to higher support worker grades and 46%, nearly half, want to progress into, into pre-reg nursing, which is um, pretty much the highest um, proportion of people wanting to progress into pre-reg. Radiography is about 45%, but that's a big chunk of the workforce that actually are potentially um, future nurses, AHPs, um, who want to progress their careers. What I suppose the overwhelming theme, and I've sort of hinted at this already, is that how um, we summarised our findings are that, and these two um, quotes you can hopefully see are from um, the survey, so they're, they're the voice of the support workers, because we gave people an opportunity to express their views. What we found is people do find their job really, really rewarding. And you can see that in the first quotes, and I've highlighted some of the, the words there, satisfaction and positive outcomes, a brilliant team, I enjoy my role. So lots of really, really positive comments about the work, but a frustration, um, and this is a, a quote by somebody else, um, but it's quite common, both of these quotes, I could have picked out lots of quotes along these lines, that actually the support workers are frustrated, that they can't progress their careers, and also feel that actually they're undervalued. Um, and you can see that there again in what, what that particular support workers talked about in terms of sometimes feeling overlooked um, and feeling they deserve more acknowledgement. So we have this almost tension but people really like their jobs but can feel um, frustrated about how their careers might progress, whatever they want to do with that career. And that, that applies to people who don't want to actually progress beyond their current grade, but wants to be the best they can uh, within their current grade. And what we found, and this, and I don't think actually what, what I've done research on a number of support worker groups, um, AHPs, um, maternity, and the themes are pretty similar. So the barriers that we found in our survey, and I should you know, stress we did find lots of good news, lots of positive messages, but there were themes that came through quite strongly from our sample about some of the barriers, some of the issues that support workers can face. Um, Firstly, this issue around consistency. So the Nuffield Trust actually found 96 different titles that are being used in mental health services to describe support workers. And I was having a talk only this afternoon, actually, with a London um, mental health ICS lead, and they've discovered in their ICS 36 titles um, for support workers. That lack of consistency also feeds through to grading. It also feeds through to the roles and responsibilities. So scope of practice can vary in different services, even though ostensibly um, they should be um, the same. So there is a real issue around uh, consistency and standardisation. There is an issue around appraisals and PDD, BD, PDPs. And I should say that um, in terms of our survey, support workers are very complementary of their managers and peers, but they did feel um, that appraisals, when they happened, and around a quarter of our sample had not had an appraisal within the last two years, um, we did the survey uh, over the summer, 
uh, and obviously COVID had an effect, but actually, you know, you'd expect over two years, the vast majority of um, the sample to have had an appraisal. For those that had, um, although they thought their managers were supportive, only 36% thought their appraisal and development plan following it actually was going to make a difference to their role. So there's something about how uh, appraisals can be made more effective, which, which I'll talk about in a moment. We also, um, as I said, when people enter the, the support workforce, they come with a whole range of qualifications. Once they're in work, what we found is there is a real issue around accessing relevant education. So at the moment, um, apprenticeships are, are very much um, the key way that NHS staff, not just support staff, but all staff are being educated. Um, but only 6% of our sample had access to apprenticeships, and only 2% of that access to the senior healthcare support work apprenticeship, which is the appropriate one for someone who's bound free and has a dedicated mental health pathway. So that was quite a surprise. Um, now, whether that's this sample, or whether that's more widely an issue, uh, I'm not sure, but there does seem to be um, a real um, issue around access and education that is relevant. The support workers we surveyed felt that they were underutilised. Um, a lot of them, the majority of the people uh, in the survey said they thought they could do more if they had support and training to do that. So this is a workforce, this talk's called um, Untapped, and I think that's, that's a really good title actually, because I think there's a real potential around the support workforce that isn't being fully realised always. And I think a big issue, which again is not unique to support workers in mental health, there is a lack of career pathways, there is a lack of information on how to progress to careers. Half the sample um, did not know what they could do in terms of next steps. All of those factors can lead to some of those um, issues around people not feeling valued, some of those points we saw in those quotes earlier. The good news is if you get this right, um, the outcomes, the benefits are really quite substantial. And there's really good evidence. I won't go through all that, that box, but if you get uh, appraisals right, if you get training right, if you integrate people into teams, there's really good outcomes, not just for support workers, but for services as well. We did ask the support workers themselves what they would like to see as improvements. And this was the top five um, that came up. And the one I draw your attention to, is, which I thought was really interesting actually, is that, that fifth one, which is what they said was actually, we'd like greater support for our managers. And I think what that means is people would like, think their managers could do with more information about options available for support workers um, to help support workers navigate the way around their careers. Um, so I've talked about apprenticeships, they're not always very straightforward apprenticeships. Um, so actually supporting managers, for example, to understand what's available, how to access it, was something that our survey um, found. There's other things that probably won't surprise uh, any of you around things like training funding, um, but also time off for training. So we did find quite a number of support workers were training in their own time. Um, they were also paying in certain cases for their own training as well. So where we are at the moment, I've been involved in support worker education, development and policy for um, two decades, actually. And I think um, these issues have been around for that time and longer. And I, I genuinely think now is actually probably the best time, actually, to be a support worker in the NHS, because most of what we need, almost all of what we need to really maximise the contribution of support workers, including mental health services, and we do need to do this, is in place. So apprenticeships are in place, appraisals are in place. What is missing currently within mental health, I would argue, is um, and this is this issue around consistency and standardisation, being clear about what support workers can do. So support workers and work at the top of the scope of their practice safely and effectively is an education and competency framework. They're existing um, in maternity, for maternity support workers, they exist for AHP support workers. Um, I think watch this space. I think there is discussions on the way around um, a similar approach for mental health support workers as well. And if that did exist, that would allow some of the issues we found to be addressed. Clearly funding is an issue, funding for training, not just for apprenticeships, which is covered by a levy, um, but also CPD funding uh, as well, which we know isn't available automatically to support workers. It's left to the um, discretion of employers. So clearly that, that is an issue that needs to be 
addressed. Information and guidance for managers and for support workers so they can see how best to maximise their contribution and leadership. And I think today um, is a brilliant, brilliant example of that. And I do want to congratulate uh, the RCN for organising today and this event. This is an example of really valuing support workers, um, really highlighting the contribution um, that support workers make. And I'm really lo looking forward to hearing um, about the days and life of support workers shortly. Um, so leadership at all levels in trust, in certain departments, um, the National Health Service leaders as well, that matters. And we do need um, better workforce planning generally in the NHS. This is quite a live issue at the moment. Um, integrated care systems are having more authority and power locally around workforce that maybe creates an opportunity for services to come together uh, and work out some of these issues collectively. So actually there is consistency between trust, there is sharing um, um, of resources and expertise as well. As I said earlier, if we get this right, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't and we really, really need to in terms of the demands on um, mental health services and the need to improve uh, capacity and capability, then the benefits are quite substantial. So finally, I just wanted to um, end with another quote from one of the support workers um, from our survey, which I think uh, encapsulates um, the message that we've taken from this, which is that is a hard job, but a rewarding job. Um, most support workers feel they are part of a supportive team, um, but they would like more recognition uh, for their experience and skills. So it's a very brief um, run through of our findings. Um, once um, the report is, is published by Health Education England, then uh, I'm sure the college will be um, sharing that and hopefully what will be um, accompanying that will be some resources um, to support a strategy. So I think I'm gonna pass back to Ellie now for the next part of the evening. So thank you. Thanks for that, Richard. That was, that was absolutely great. And, and just to introduce me, I'm Ellie Gordon. I'm chair of the Royal College of Nursing Mental Health Forum, and I'm a mental health nurse. And just to say, we're really proud to be supporting this event and, and stand alongside our colleagues who are healthcare support workers, because we absolutely appreciate what a brilliant contribution they make to patient and service user care. So we're really proud to be to be part of this event. Um, so for the next section, we're going to introduce some colleagues who are just going to talk about their stories and, and almost like a day in the life of um, their, their working lives as a, as a healthcare support worker and other roles. And the first person I'm going to introduce is Ophelia Salmon Brown. Hi, everybody. Oh, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I am, my name is Ophelia. I'm a support worker at Southwest London Mental Health Trust. Um, I've been within the role for 10 plus years now. And sorry, so I've worked in Southwest London Mental Health Trust as a support worker for the past 10 years. Um, I've worked across a number of areas um, in a sense of I've worked with adults, children, but the main bulk of my professional time has come from within the forensic service. Um, during my time there, oh God, sorry. Sorry guys. Um, so yeah, so during my time working within the medium secure forensic service, um, I've seen many positive changes um, over the time and over the time with care and management of the challenging behaviours and trying to maintain um, a safe therapeutic environment. Um, and this is through a number of initiatives over time to reduce restrictive practice um, and a number of other management tools where we can manage patients' behavior. <laughs> oh Lord. I am so sorry, guys. I know my time is short and this is the first time I've really spoken publicly, so I'm terribly nervous. So um, my motivations, what motivated me to work within the mental health field, um, I've got a personal journey of my own. I have an older sister who has struggled for at least the best part of 
maybe 25 years with um, schizophrenia. So that was part of what led me down to this pathway so I could understand more, understand maybe why, what's contributed and how we can best help as a family. Um, and actually during my time working in my support, ro support worker role, I have learned so much, which has actually helped. Um, during my journey now, I have now gone back to train. So I'm currently in the post of a trainee nurse and associate. My reason for wanting to go and study was where I've been doing this work for so long, I needed to understand a little bit of the knowledge behind my practice and why we actually do what it is that we do. Um, during my time on the course, it has really enriched me in that kind of way. Um, moving on, I'm gonna go and touch on some of my challenges I've had during my journey. Um, and a lot, a lot of what our first speaker had highlighted were a lot of my um, challenges over the time. So, you know, not having access to training opportunities or training opportunities that weren't only just nursing related. Because like mentioned before, there's a number of us that bring different, different skills and experiences into the space. And actually, if there was more pathways for us, um, you know, I don't know, more pathways would have been helpful. Anyway. Um, oh, so yeah, so more opportunities. Some of the other challenges I've found along the way is like, you know, the culture of the ward and um, yeah, management. And I don't want to maybe give a negative spin because during my time I have had negative experiences, but like I'd said earlier and on, it's just that there have been a lot of positive changes happening. So again, positive changes, We there are more opportunities in terms of training, even within our trust at the moment, which is new to me is the learning and development team, which I didn't really understand what their purpose was and who they were. And they've helped me significantly in the last year and very much so in the last couple of months. Um, on a positive note, and I'm going to actually kind of finish off here, is um, during my training, I've had the opportunity to go to um, a number of different wards um, as placement opportunities where I've had an, an, um, a chance to really develop my um, physical health skills. And with those skills, I've been able to bring them back into my workforce. But however, during placement, being from a mental health background, I was actually able to um, use transferable skills, which I've developed in mental health. <laughs> so um, that is another positive note. So I'm going to wrap it up now. But what I would like as a take home message for everybody here is just that there's a number of different things that bring us to this space of mental health or any healthcare profession, to be fair. Um, and actually, all I just want us to remember is that um, we come here to do a job and we have a duty of care, not only to our clients or our colleagues or their families or the client's families. I just want us to. Um, one thing that's very important to me um, is delivering really good care. And I just, all of us here, I just want you to remember, you see the day when that spark or that, that thing that drives you to come to work every day leaves, unfortunately, it might be time for you to follow as well, or find something to reignite that light again. Never find yourself being one of those staff members on a ward where you just say I'm just here to do my shift and go breaks my heart so that's my take home message sorry if I was a little bit all over the place this is my first time and again this is another positive thing it's an opportunity for me to be able to put myself out there again develop develop my own skills and confidence so thank you everybody for listening and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be in this space and to um, share my experience. Oh, if there's any questions, please do ask and I will ask them the best way I can, whether it's now or later. Thank you.
really have to say that's your first time that was brilliant thank you so much for that it, it's really lovely to hear your passion and how much you're learning in that nursing associate role that was absolutely fantastic thank you and then the thank next you. person it's a pleasure the next person we have is Angela Hawkins Sorry about that, I couldn't get myself off mute. Uh, my name is Angela Hawkins. Um, I'm a registered nursing associate, currently working on the Adult Eating Disorders Ward at Springfield Hospital in Tooting. I started working in healthcare in 2007. Prior to this, I'd spent 17 years working as an electronics engineer. I've always had a heart for care work and I had some wonderful experiences as a volunteer, but it was hard to leave the career I was familiar with and consider moving over to care work full time. However, when I was made redundant at the end of 2006, I decided to move out of my comfort zone and pursue a full time career in care work. I spent seven years working in the care home for adults with learning disabilities, where I gained an NVQ2 before becoming a healthcare assistant at Springfield Hospital in September 2014. I chose the eating disorders pathway because I thought that I would be able to use my own experiences and insight of struggling with this illness to the benefit of the ward. I think at times my experience has been helpful as I feel that I've been able to understand to a small extent some of the emotions that the patients on the ward may be experiencing. But I've also found that the extreme emotional and physical suffering that the patients have been through is far beyond anything I coped with. And I find this very hard to witness and understand at times. In 2015, I undertook and passed my NVQ3 in healthcare. As I was contemplating whether to do my NVQ4, the trust started deputing candidates from the Associate Practitioner Foundation degree. At about the same time, there was a talk of the Nursing Associate pathway being introduced but that course hadn't been finalized, but I liked the sound of the Nursing Associate Foundation degree because it offered placement experience in a variety of different healthcare settings. Towards the end of 2016, the Nursing Associate pathway was finalized and I was lucky to be chosen as a candidate to enter this course, which was run alongside the Associate Practitioner course. Well, I can honestly say that although the nursing associate training took me far outside my comfort zone and pushed me beyond what I thought I could achieve, I feel that it was the best thing I've done in my career to date. Through it, I've learned so much about myself and discovered that despite the challenges and anxieties I experience, I can achieve much more than I ever thought was possible. The thing that I love most about my job is the sheer variety of it. On a typical day, following handover, I may be asked to act as a shift coordinator or be the medication nurse for the shift. As it is an eating disorders ward, there are always patient meals to prepare and observe, a task which we share out amongst the MDT. Uh, sorry. The MDT handovers and zoning meetings are an opportunity to take to talk about patient care on a wider scale. And they also offer an opportunity to get more interesting insights into how other disciplines across the MDT, i.e., the OT, the psychologists, family therapists, dietitian, and consultants are working with patients and their families. I enjoy key working my key clients and working with them to create meaningful care plans. 
as a nursing associate, I'm also responsible for supervising three healthcare assistants and mentoring training nursing associates. One of the most challenging parts of my role is undertaking nasogastric feeds for our most severely ill patients. When patients feel unable to manage their diet orally, this treatment enables us to pass nutrition directly into their stomachs via a feeding tube which is inserted in their nose. Occasionally, we will have a patient that is compliant with this procedure, but more often than not, we have to restrain patients in order to give them this life-saving treatment. And we may have to do this up to three times a day. It's a very emotional experience at times. Another challenging part of the job is trying to manage the extreme lengths that some patients will go to in order to restrict their dietary intake and also the levels of activity they undertake to try and reduce weight gain. Our patient group appears to be highly driven by their illnesses and it can be extremely difficult to change their thinking processing. The most rewarding part of my job is when we nurse someone through the NG feeding stage and restore their physical health as they transition to a normal diet and then witness them prepare for discharge back into the community. It's a wonderful experience when we see an individual who has appeared to be so stuck in their illness really blossom and come out of their shell and have a real desire to achieve goals for their life. It makes everything they do feel so worthwhile. For me, mental health has been an amazing journey thus far. Yes, it's, it's taken me, it's been overwhelming and it's been challenging at times, but I'm glad that I took the risk to step out of my comfort zone. It's a journey that keeps giving me surprises and has taken me to several different emotional locations over the years, but I feel it has strengthened my character and I think I would be a poorer person had I not experienced and conquered some of the personal challenges I have faced. I think when I joined the war with some of my colleagues, seeing my character thought that I wouldn't survive long in mental health. Um, but I'm surprised both them and myself with what I've achieved thus far. I think my message to anyone considering a, a career in mental health would be hold on tight and prepare for the journey of a lifetime. You won't be disappointed. Thank you. Thanks for that, Angela. I'm, so, I'm going to keep that quote, prepare for a journey of a lifetime. I think that's absolutely lovely. I'm, I'm going to take that one when I'm back in my day job. And just really powerful to hear how, like you say, you made such a leap in changing your career and, and you just found it so incredibly rewarding ever since so thank you for sharing that so the next person we've got is Sunday Babanumi hello everybody uh good evening my name is Sunday Babanumi I work in uh, Greater Manchester Mental Health in uh, Manchester here yeah. And uh, I've been there for some time now, but the question I would like us to ask for is, why you mental health? Why do, I, why do I want to become a support worker? Why do I want to join the community of support workers? Those are questions people ask me all the time. And why Royal College of Nursing? Why not other union? that support support worker even more than they think we do. And the answer I give them is what? I'm going to give every one of us that are here today to see clearly the difference between doing what is right and achieving what you want. Firstly, uh, I joined Royal College of Nursing because for a long time, many people thought Royal College of Nursing is for nurses only, not for nursing. So the language I've changed to nursing now. 
And what I'm saying to all support workers that are here today is to go out there, me and you, let's start telling all our members that Royal College of Nursing is for nursing only, not just for nurses. And let me tell you something that is very clear. I'm so proud for who I am, the Royal College of Nursing. There are challenges in mental health, no doubt about it, because we are dealing with vulnerable people, people that are very vulnerable in society, people that need help very critical help. That's why we are there. And whether we like, whether they like it or not, we are the first point of contact for any, sub, any uh, what can I call it now, any service users that come on any of the wards. Because that's a, we're the first that will contact with them. We're the one that will make them comfortable. The one that will make them be available, that we are always available to help. So why have we been overlooked for a long time? Because many times we have been told, do this and we do it. None of us have ever asked questions. Why don't we do it this way? Why don't we do it this way? I can tell you clearly, in the past couple of years, I've been in mental health as a support worker. Yes, I've seen challenges. But at the same time, I've been able to put in my own ideas, one way or the other, to management to listen. Why am I even a rep? Because many of us, we look like, they ask me questions. You are a support worker. Why are you a rep? Because sky is the limit in Royal College of Nursing. You can be anything you want to be. There are always chances there. I started to be a rep from being a learning rep to, health, to safety rep. Then I dropped learning rep, I became a steward. And now I'm a member of the Committee for Support Workers in Northwest. So that I'm telling you clearly, that there is a need for each one of us to be part of this system. This idea that we are putting together needs a voice. And that voice is me and you, that we are here today listening to each other. Change your mentality about what support water is all about. Support water is progress. Support water is support worker as somebody that knows what he wanted when he joined and sky is limit. Yeah, there are challenges in educational, there are challenges in many ways. But can I tell you something that you need to know first? You need to be positive of who you are. Who are you? That's the question you ask yourself. After this wonderful day today, which we all have agreed for once, this is the second time we have this kind of thing. But after today, ask yourself, who are you? Are you a support worker that wants to bring development to where you are? It doesn't matter any close place you are bring something positive. And that's what all we're talking about. Today is a wonderful day. I'm proud to put on the t-shirt and to say, yes, I'm a support worker. How proud are you to do it? You must be proud of who you are. And when by saying this, I'm saying, the time is now. Let there be changes in your thinking about who support worker is. Go out there tomorrow let your nurses know that you are a team, that we're working together as a team, not just as a nursing assistant and just by the wayside. Your character, your behavior, and your knowledge will help you in any area you want to be. But that knowledge must be shown clearly that you know what you're doing. When you're going to work in the morning, have a smile in your face. And that's what I do all the time. A smile in your face, let them know that you have come to work with joy and happiness. Yes, there are lapses in the educational area of it. Many times we don't know the pathway to go. But can I tell you something that looks, it looks strange to so many people, but because maybe because I'm a rep, all these avenues to get better, to grow in your education are on the internet. Go there, fill it up, speak to your line manager. Let them know that you know what you wanted or else nobody's going to listen to you. So my, my, my advice today as a mental health, which I am proud to be part of the mental health support worker team, is that sky is the limit when it comes to looking after the vulnerables. The vulnerables are there and the joy we get from looking after them is that they get better and they go. I'll give you an example. There was a, there was a particular patient who came to us comfortably and along the line, 
we, we, we were together as a team and she got better. I was driving along. Manchester area sometimes, this person was just shouting, Sunday, 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 ah, who is this? She was so happy. And I, I was, I feel fulfilled. So when you're doing anything you think is the right thing to do, you feel fulfilled. So ladies and gentlemen that are listening to me at this moment, we are there to make a change. We are there for our voice to be heard. That voice could be heard positively, but the character comes from you only. You first. Who do you think you are? Are you sure that what you are doing is what you want to do? Because it's not a matter of I don't want to do it. If you don't want to do it at all, don't be there. But I'm proud to say I'm a support worker and I am there to continue bringing positive impact in every area of mental health or nursing in general. Thank you very much. I won't say more than that. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, Sunday. Really, just a really positive talk. And I think you're absolutely right. The voice of the healthcare support worker is incredibly important and absolutely has to be listened to. And I think... I think you, you, virtually your final point about the time is now is absolutely right. The time is now. And it, it's a really great point to raise that, that it's a really, really important role and an important contribution to the care of very vulnerable people. So thank you for that. That was great. And our last speaker in this section is Davina Dixon. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I've, I'm extremely lucky in my journey as a healthcare worker. And after hearing some of the statistics by Richard, I realized just how lucky I am. I started in working in healthcare four years, four and a half years ago now. And um, I kind of fell into it. I had a career change after taking a year off of work to, um, I'm, my son is, has autism and I took a year out of work because he, I managed to get him into, a specialist school which was quite far away and I took the year off to be able to take him there and back so I did a um, level three qualification in health and social care for adults just because it was interesting for me and then I did some volunteering work just to fill my time and then I happened to, to have a conversation with somebody at the voluntary where I was volunteering and they suggested I um, go for a job as support as a support worker which I did and luckily got the job within a few months I started um, my supervisor suggested that I do the assistant practitioner course which I felt very scared of doing because I used to be a very shy person but I went for it anyway and it was the best move I ever made um, I was supported by my manager I the, there's a the difference between the nurse and associate and the assistant practitioner is that assistant practitioner does more around mental health they don't do placements they just stay on the ward that they work in I was very happy with that because I didn't have lots of confidence to move around to different placements but I learned so much on the job training that I really developed and grew and my my team really supported me in being able in giving me new tasks as my confidence and my development grew. So it was a really great learning curve for me. I completed the band four assistant practitioner course in 2019, and it just opened up so many doors for me. I think a band four is really good because you still get to do all the wonderful jobs that a uh, health, health, healthcare worker does. You get to spend lots of time with the service users, which is the reason I do the job. But you also get to do, have more responsibility and make choices and you're, I feel that I'm heard. My opinion is heard and valued within the place that I work. I work at Lotus Assessment Suite in Springfield Hospital. It's a 48 hour assessment unit and it also holds the health based place of safety. So Lotus is where informal patients come in if they go to any because they're feeling suicidal or they are in crisis. It's an urgent care and crisis centre. The health 
base place of safety is quite different in that it is where people are brought when they're detained under section 136 by the police because the police are worried about their mental health. So I work in both sectors and I absolutely love it. It gives me so much joy. It's very challenging. I hate having to restrain people because I find it very distressing when I see other people distressed. Um, unfortunately, sometimes we have to do that, but I always take the compassion and care to talk that person through everything that's happening to them. I remember one, one particular day we had a guy brought him to the 136 um, health-based place of safety and he had bipolar and he was having a very manic phase. And he, I went to get, I was sat with him for about three hours and he decided he wanted some refreshments. So I went to get them. Why I was away getting his refreshments, he became very erratic and his behavior changed dramatically. I supported him. We had to call a team and I supported him and helped him through it. And eventually he was moved on to go to another ward where he could have a longer stay in hospital. And as he was leaving, he, in his moment of kind of like manic presentation, he actually thanked me for being so caring. And that is the reward that you get from this job. You know, when people are in distress, when they're not well and they feel cared for, I think that speaks for so much. I've, I've been very, very lucky in that I'm now doing my nursing training. I'm in just coming up to the end of my second year. I'm, I've had a really, really exciting journey and I'm very, very lucky to have had such an exciting journey. I've got to know lots of people around the trust that are working while I've been doing this place, this nursing um, course, because I'm doing lots of different placements. I'm getting to see what else is out there because I've only ever worked on Lotus since I've been in, been in healthcare. But it's been a marvellous, interesting journey for me. I love being able to just sit with people that are distressed, talk to them, help them feel calmer, talk with them, listen to them. Because people just want to be heard sometimes or just play a game of Scrabble and help distract them. I love that part of my job. I also love the, the part of my job where I can, under supervision, assess patients and make plans for them to get support in the community or get them further treatment in hospital. Um, I've been very lucky on my journey. And I think the important thing, if you do want to progress, when people see that you're a hard worker and they see your potential, they, they want to give you opportunity. The way to get to know what's going on in your trust is to really get a, a link in with the nursing development team within your trust because they know all the courses that are going on they know how many places they are you know link in with them get to know them and you will be able to move forward if you want to or just make the most of what you're doing at the moment and you know that's that's me really thank you for listening Thanks so much, Davina. That was absolutely lovely. I think there's already a few comments saying, you know, you must be it must be really nice to be cared for by you because you have such a nice way of viewing that doing something that that's, seems quite simple as caring and being compassionate makes such a huge difference to somebody, especially when in distress. So so thank you so much for that. And and just say thank you to all our speakers in that segment. Certainly I saw I heard lots of um reference to words such as lots of variety and really interesting and really rewarding I think from all the speakers that message certainly came across to me loud and clear what a really fascinating and really challenging but also really really rewarding role this is when working in in mental health so thank you so much to all of you for for giving up your time and sharing your experiences it's really really invaluable and it really helps to bring the role alive and, and the importance of what you all do is, is is just so important thank you so much for for doing that to be honest so I'll just move on to our next speaker and this one's entitled My Story and it's an expert by experience story and it's David Stocks who's now going to talk to us.
Well, hi everyone. Um, yeah, my story, um, it started in the middle of the night um, and it started when I was admitted to a ward um, and I was in crisis and I didn't know what was going on. And it wasn't the doctors and nurses that made me a cup of tea. It was one of my fellow patients that said, Dave, you fancy a cup of tea? And that cup of tea meant the world to me. It was a life raft to me at that time. Um, and by um, talking to my fellow patient, I realised then that I wasn't alone. I was I was with other people on this journey, um, and there were other people experiencing the same sort of thing. But um, as you, some of you may be aware, there's sometimes a lack of activities on wards. It's got a lot better now because um, uh, things have improved since when I was first admitted, but there's sometimes a lack of activities on wards. Um, so I'd actually started writing a book before I was admitted to the ward. And I thought, oh, well, maybe I can continue writing that book. But the ward didn't allow com uh, computers onto it. Um, I had a, beat up old laptop and they didn't allow computers on it. Um, so um, it was a support worker um, that um, sort of negotiated to get my laptop um, kept securely in the linen cupboard of all places. <laughs> so there I was, day in, day out, in and out of the linen cupboard. Well, it aroused the um, curiosity of my uh, fellow patients. I said, Dave, can't help noticing that you spend rather a long time in the linen cupboard. Well, I had to say, actually, it's not that I've got a fetish for clean linen. Um, um, I've, I've got, I'm keeping my computer in there. I said, oh, oh yeah. And, and uh, why, what are you doing with the computer? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a book. Oh, really? And as the days and weeks went on, um, the, uh, um, my fellow patients got more and more interested in, in the uh, book I was writing. And I was encouraged by the support workers. Now, my experience on the wards, and I'm saying this because this is specifically about support workers, is unfortunately nurses are so bogged down with paperwork and things that they have to do, mandatory activities that they have to do. It's actually the support workers that do a lot of the interacting with the patients, a lot of the support, a lot of the care for the patients. So without the support workers, there'd be a lot less, what I would say, heart in the wards, a lot less care in the wards. Um, and I know there's mandatory paperwork. I know there's mandatory tasks you have to do and we need to keep people safe but keeping people safe is actually caring for them and supporting them and uh, that's what the support workers do without that care and support that's when people decline and go into a bad place and can um cause problems or become suicidal. So it's important to get that care and support. And that's where the care, the support workers come in. And with the encouragement of my fellow patients and the support workers, I eventually read out some of, some of my book um, to my fellow patients. 
And there was nothing more rewarding than having a ward full of depressed patients laughing at something I've written. Because I, even in my darkest places, I've, I've, I am always retain a sense of humour. And I like to put humour into most, most things. Um, so that really encouraged me. And my book became my therapy. And uh, I, the longer I spent in hospital, the more of the book I completed until the end of my stay in hospital coincided with the end, uh, with the completion of my book. Now, this is something that I really got to get over to you. No matter how silly a dream may seem, if someone comes to you with that dream it's that they want to achieve, it's, it's not, you want to try and support it in any way you can. Now, I had a careers advisor come to me after uh, I was discharged from hospital and said, Dave, what would you like to do? And well, I said, I've, I've, I've written this book and I'd quite like to get it published. They said, no chance, mate. No chance on this world. No one ever gets books published. Now, you remember, this was my therapy for the last uh, few months in, in, in hospital. And in those few words, it quashed it. So what, thankfully, I'm quite stubborn. And I sent it off to a publisher anyway. And, I got a publishing contract by return post. I went, then went on to have a successful book launch in Nottingham Waterstones and a full page article about me and my book in, in the Nottingham Evening Post. I then wanted to give something back and I started volunteering for Rethink and I took part in the party conferences that year. And Rethink, um, were you know campaigning outside the car party, party conferences and it, there's a certain foppish bumbling politician that i bumped into and it's quite a number of years ago this and uh that politician happened to be boris johnson um and as a result of that meeting I had a full page article in the uh guardian about me about people power uh, with a rather fetching picture of me next to Boris Johnson. Unfortunately, I had a Mad Hatter's outfit on at the time because of how we were campaigning. But I do promise you, I did give his Mad Hatter's outfit back afterwards. Um, and so from there, I wanted to do more. Um, and I got talk, told about radar. Um, and RADAR is a Royal Association of Disability Rights who ran a leadership programme. And I went on that leadership programme and uh, it wasn't the uh, coaches or workshops um, that uh, made a difference to me. It was the other disabled people. So we all had different disabilities. Mine was mental health, but it was the other it's the peers with all their inspirational stories that made a difference to me. And from there, um, I started volunteering for RADAR as well and took part in the MP dialogue scheme. And through RADAR, um, through the MP dialogue scheme, I spoke to my local MP who, who was really, really good. Um, and he had a lot, did a lot of work with the forces and he told me something about mental health that I didn't know at the time, that people were only just then getting diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, uh, who'd come back from the Falklands. So I didn't know there was such a delayed reaction from that. And we put plans in place to improve things for people with mental health and disabilities in, within his constituency. Um, and from there, there was a reception in Parliament, which I was somehow persuaded to speak at. Um, and 
it was packed to the rafters with lords, ladies, gentlemen, um, uh, baronesses, OBs, CBs, um, you name it. And it was absolutely filled. And I got to the lecture and I thought, oh, and you can guess the second word. And I rambled on for much like I am doing now for 10 minutes. And I have no idea what I said. But at the end of the 10 minutes, you could hear a pin drop and then the biggest round of applause you ever did hear. And then I went on to uh, work for, run Radar's leadership program um, for four years, helping disabled people get into leadership posts. Um, after, when the, the funding finished for that, I became an expert by experience for the trust I work in. I've worked in a couple of different roles within that the trust since then. I'm uh, now a suicide prevention community development worker, helping um, stop, uh, helping prevent as many suicides as possible and going out into the community and being proactive rather than reactive and getting people the help when they need it and getting people talking about their mental health. And that was all because of that one cup of tea and all because there were people like the support work workers who believed in me and were there for me. So thank you. for that David that, that was absolutely brilliant and I think that's just a really lovely way to to round off those um presentations and just really lovely like you were saying about the importance of a cup of tea I think that's a really lovely message that if, if people take nothing else that it's that importance of a cup of tea and having somebody just spending a little bit of time makes such a massive difference so so thank you very much I really really appreciate that and I as far as I know I think we're now moving to a Q&A session Are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. I've just I lost, lost you. <laughs> yeah, we're moving to a question uh, and answers. And also, if they can use the chat area so that we can see the questions come up, it would make it much easier for, for us. So if anybody has any questions for us, Ellie and I will be reading them out um, and the relevant ones um, and then to invite a reflection on it as well. And I think Oprah and Stephen are going to support us in answering where needed. I've just, so I've just seen a question pop up in the chat. I'm happy to, to but I will ask everybody now that I'll try and answer a little bit myself. There's somebody saying that we're really interested in um, applying for a healthcare support worker role, which is absolutely brilliant. I always really delighted to, to hear that, but but where did they start? I mean, I would assume, um, and yourselves that are support workers can answer this much better than me, but I would assume it's about looking at your little mental health trust website, looking for jobs on there. I'm not sure how you found your roles, actually. It would probably be really interesting to hear that. Um, well, I can, I can answer that, but my role came, um, that I came into, um, I'm a qualified chef, um, so my role totally changed for me um, when I nursed my parents until both of them died. And we had a family business, which was a pub and restaurant. And from that, I lost total interest in what I was doing. And I said to my friend, I haven't got a clue what I'm going to do now. And he said, look, he said, you've, you've nursed your mom and dad um, at a time of when they actually needed support and it's valuable lessons that you've learned that you can pass on in nursing and um, become a, a healthcare assistant try it and see if you like it that well that sort of put the fear of god into me really because i thought oh my god in hospital where people die on you in there um I, I don't know whether i can do that but then when I did get the job as an auxiliary, I worked on an elderly um, ward and actually people didn't die on you. They got better and they went home. And the feeling 
that you helped somebody recover, return home to their loving family, that gave me immense joy and I just loved that. And, I, and from then, I went on to further my career and did my NVQ2, NVQ3. I got my degree, foundation degree. I'm now a band four associate practitioner at Chesterley Street. And I love the job that I do. Going out, making a difference to people's lives, going that extra step to make sure they get the care and attention. And that's what got me into nursing. And it was through my parents being ill how I came to do my job. I hope that was, I hope Yeah, no, it was great. I was just thinking if any of our other speakers would be able to um, help outline how they came into, because it, it's, I think it's invaluable, like I say, came into here, everybody's experience and what brought you into the role and what attracted you. And I suppose a little bit about, you know, how do you, actually apply for these roles how do you even find out that they're there um, and and then actually apply for them it'd be great if someone could give us some tips on that the, some of them um within our trust some of them are advertised um on our intranet um and so you'd probably get through word of mouth that if you if you've got a friend that's in the healthcare industry you can always put out to them there are some agencies out there um that um, will also look for healthcare support workers. And there are lots and lots of um, agencies out there who are looking um, to do that. Um, for, to work within the NHS, whether it be mental health, again, that for me, um, that would be a niche because I think you have to be a certain type of person to work within mental health. And I think you have to be a certain type of mental uh, sort of nurse to work within the community and a certain type of nurse to work within children's settings because not everybody can do that. When I worked um, in Skabu and on children's ward, it was far different from what it is now. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed the work that I did, but I think you've got to have a, a want or a, a, a sort of interest in that area for you to be able to do that but i think if you're looking for to join you need to contact your local um hospitals and uh, hr to see what jobs are available within mental health or within um the the trusts the acute trusts and There's also also, the, the, also within nursing homes you know if you contacted the nursing homes if you wanted to become a carer in the nursing home, then if you contacted them, they would put you in touch with their HR and would let you know what was available. And there is going to be a, a shortage because as you know, COVID is here and we now have to be vaccinated and you have to have all three. And there's a lot of people who left the pro profession because they choose personally not to have that vaccine. So. I feel that there's going to be, a, and it's my opinion, nobody else's, just mine, that there's going to be a lot more vacancies within nursing homes if people don't want to have that vaccine. So I don't know whether that helps or not. So There's also a, um, a website called Track Jobs and lots of NHS trusts um, put their vacancies <laughs> onto there. So it's worth signing up and registering and putting your CV up on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, Ellie, it's Ofra here. Um, welcome everybody. And um, thank you so much for everybody who's contributed um, this evening. Um, we do have some other questions in the chat. Um, there's a really good question. Uh, oh, it's just shifted again from Amber. And I think the question is, um, what is the difference uh, or ma what makes um, a mental health support worker different from a support worker in other areas? And it would be great to hear from the participants in, in relation to that. And I think we've heard some of that today. Thank you. Sunday, you're on mute, I think. 
Yes, uh, what makes it different between a support worker and a mental health worker? That's no different. The only difference is that, the, that there is a bigger risk as a mental health support worker. Uh, as a support worker who is not in mental health, you go to work, you go to hospitals, you do your part, you go home. But in mental health, you need a special training. What I mean by special training, they need to put you through restraint and aggression training. They need to put you through MPQ. There's a lot of training that you need to go through. But sincerely, it's worth it. But there's one thing that we need to know. If you want to be a mental health support worker, you have to go from being a support worker for about some particular time. Then you apply for that through one agency or the other or online to NHS, mental health. They train you. Sometimes you become apprentice support worker. If they can train you and you're better, then you become a support worker. So you still need to go through the same line of training. So it's just a little edge above the normal support worker because of the risk involved. That's just it. There's nothing special about it. You can do it. Thank you. For me, it's having an understanding <laughs> of different mental health illnesses. It's having an understanding. It's, it's being prepared to listen because when people are distressed, they feel the need to be heard. So I think if you've got the traits of being caring, compassionate, but having good firm boundaries and being a really good listener, then you've got the traits to be a mental health support worker because lots of your time in mental health will be spent on the floor with the service users. Um, you will be spending much of the time talking, playing games, distraction techniques, um, talking people down when they're in distress. So it's really good to be non-judgmental, really good to have a real ear for listening, but being boundaried as well. Thanks, Davina. I think Ophelia wanted to come in. I think you just have to unmute yourself, Ophelia. Thank you. Hi. So I, I agree with the Davina and Sunday as they contributed to the qualities and skills that, um, that a support worker would have. Um, but then also with that, it, the boundaries, consistency, and the non-judgmental non approach, but also having some kind of understanding and respect for where people are coming from their journey and how their experiences and maybe traumas that they count in their life and how it's and what we see today so it's just literally compassion patience heart um, and that's why I will always stress that if you you lose that care or that passion mental health you don't want to now contribute to a further problem because of how we engage with our service users. So um, that's what I'd like to add. Thanks, Ophelia. Um, I think we've got uh, time for one question. Is that right? Are we finishing at seven, Sarah? I'm just checking. Um, there are some um, comments around experiences in mental health and I think um, a lot of the conversations that were had this evening incorporated that but I, I just wondered whether um, David um, you talked a little bit about some of the voluntary experiences that you, you did whether you could just expand on that because um, there's a theme in the chat thank you yeah. Sorry, I was struggling to find the unmute button then. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, the voluntary experiences. Yeah, I volunteered as an expert by experience. I don't know if people have heard of experts by experience. They're sometimes called different things in different trusts. Um, I always say it's great to, great to be an expert in something, so at least I'm an expert in myself. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I volunteered as an expert by experience and... In our trust, I, I didn't realise, I didn't realise how many areas I could get involved in. 
And also, I didn't realise how much went on in the trust. In fact, I'm still discovering to this day how much goes on in the trust. Um, uh, but being an expert by experience, it, it gave me a whole new perspective. So, um, like for instance, today I was interviewing for um, some band six posts and I invited another expert by experience onto the interview panel because I felt it was invaluable for to have that experts by experience on the on the interview panel. And it it gives and I was able to do that when I was an expert by experience. I was able to, able to go on to um, interview panels. I was be able, I was able to present to the board. I was uh, able to um, uh, take part, uh, um, review comms material. So, so you know, you've seen some of the materials that go out. They can be rather bland, rather unimpressive. Um, by reviewing it as an expert by experience, we could see what was needed and what wasn't, and also identify actually you're missing out um, easy read or you're missing out other other languages. Um, so we could have direct input into that. Um, like I am here now, I'm speaking at an event, I'd be invited to speak to doctors and nurses and they could get uh, get to see from the service user's point of view. Um, one of the best fit areas that I used to get to speak in was um, staff inductions. So when you get a new member of staff into the trust, so invaluable to get that service user experience, someone speaking about um, the care that they've received and what what is would be best best for them um, within the trust. So it's giving that lived experience. I've spoke, spoken to commissioners, so I've, I've spoken about the four stages of a crisis as I see it, um, and uh, how it's how it's important to um, stop um, uh, be proactive within mental health. So rather than uh, wait for the crisis to escalate to the third or fourth stage, you try and tackle it at the first stage. So I've spoken to commissioners about the importance of early intervention. So there's so, so much you could get involved in as an expert by experience. And that's just one of the areas I volunteer for. You know, say I volunteer for Rethink. Um, um, through Rethink, I took part in the Time to Change campaigns. Um, I spoke on radio as a result of the Time to Change campaigns. Um, we even commandeered a Sheffield tram as part of the Time to Change. And we changed it into a padded cell. So people got onto it and thought, what the going on here? And I said, well, actually, this is what pe a lot of people still think we should be in. We, we're, we're still sent to padded cells. And um, no, actually, we're human beings. And that, that's another thing I've, I often speak about. I, I often speak to doctors and nurses and say, look, I have a bipolar mental health condition. But actually, I'm a human being first. So don't look at me as my condition. Look at me as my human, as a human being. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a photographer. Um, I love going out, walking my dogs. Um, I love the fresh air and exercise. Uh, I play tennis. Um, uh, I'm a writer um, and and a reader. Uh, uh, so I'm um, all of these things. I just happen to have a mental health condition as well, and it take interest in people. So, yeah, uh, volunteering has given me the opportunity to be able to um, let people see things from a different perspective. Um, and it's also it's what led me to get jobs as well. So it's through volunteering that I've, I, I managed to get the job with Radar and eventually managed to get jobs within this trust and the job that, that I'm in now, which is my dream job. So, yeah.
Thanks for that, David. I think that, that was great. And I must admit, just um, being here today has really reminded me two key things I was taught when I first qualified as a mental health nurse. One was always listen to the patients in your care because you'll learn more from your patients than you will anybody else or any textbook or any training course. So always listen to your patients. And the second one was if and when you don't know what you're doing, because when you first start, you often don't know what you're doing as a mental health nurse go talk to the healthcare support workers because they know what they're doing and they'll see you right. And I, to this day, they're the messages I always have in my head. And I have to say that, I think it was said earlier in Richard's talk, that healthcare support workers really are the unsung heroes in health and social care. And they're invariably the people that are spending the most time with patients and the ones with the listening ear and the cup of tea. And just it's just such an invaluable contribution and I just hope today has given even just a little bit of a snapshot of what an amazing role it really is and how diverse it is and how essential healthcare support workers across health and social care and all those areas on a day-to-day -day basis and are very quietly getting on with a really really important job so as I say from from our foreign point of view it's a real pleasure to be asked to support this and just say a massive thank you to everything that 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 you all do and, and just well, just to say we see you, we hear you, and we know how essential you are, and we're really happy to stand alongside you and work with you, because we owe you so much, and, and, and we always will do, and as I say, goes, we're always stronger together, and, and we work better together, so it's just certainly a massive, a massive thank you for me, for, for, for many years of helping me keep on the right tracks, so I wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, so thank you for that it's it's great and just to say very quickly thank you for everybody who's attended because uh, we know it's an evening it's a winter's evening and they're not it's not easy to, to get motivated to attend these events but thank you everybody who turned up and we put lots of links in the chat about if you're interested in applying for one of these roles or you want to know a little bit more about the college we put links to the to the website we've put a little link in for a short feedback service and we would really appreciate it if you could click on the link and just spend a few minutes fizzing that in so that can feed into more work that we do and so we can learn from your experiences this evening but the main thing says thank you so much for coming and being with us today and, and really hope you join us again on the 23rd of November next year when we celebrate Healthcare Support Workers Day again and thank you and, and, and good night and have a lovely evening thank you very much <laughs>